Let me take a moment and um, <clears throat> just say, I, was, I did a breakfast talk and a lunch talk. And when I got here, the, I guess she's a curator, I'm not sure, but took me on a tour of the Voices of Greensboro. I feel like I've lived here 12 years already. It's really, <laughs> and what's impressive is how, I would say, how great your sense of community is. Because you have welcomed me into that, and I appreciate that very much. So thank you for allowing me to be with you today. Um, Basically, what I wanted to do in this talk was a little less technical and a little more kind of philosophical because I do think it's unambiguously true. Healthcare is a journey, and you just heard my long saga, which sounds like I can't really hold a job. I mean, that's the truth. <laughs> I moved from thing to thing. But the truth is, I've been in Washington so long that um, I have taken on some of the characteristics. But I will say one thing about the history there. Uh, I am committed to what you might call bipartisan conversation. Um, you will see soon enough I am indeed a supporter of the Affordable Care Act and I do believe it's necessary both morally to take care of human beings who can't take care of themselves and economically because we can't afford not to do this. But I, it's also true there are a lot of people who don't agree with me and I think it's important that we remember we've got to talk to each other. One great thing about Washington, believe it or not, even now behind closed doors, and it only is happening behind closed doors, they do still talk to each other. I have been to dinners in the last two months with people from both sides who are seriously grappling with how to deal with, essentially, how do we create a pathway down from these tree branches we're on back to a common conversation. So don't lose hope. That's a lot of what this is about. Don't lose hope. We can do better and we will. You might wonder why is reform so darn hard? And I found this picture and thought that was pretty perfect because you know even if everybody agreed that this was the right thing to do, it would be hard. I mean think about it. We are trying to transform one-sixth of the economy we are trying to make it possible for the first time in our history for all Americans to have access to decent, even high quality health care at a price they and our country as a whole can afford. That's a pretty ambitious set of tasks. So of course it's hard, but why is it so hard? Well, you know, there really are competing worldviews. There are people who wake up in the morning and they think, you know, it's not my job to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. That's their responsibility. And that, that sentiment is real and legitimate. And then there's another group of people, which is a much larger group of people, that says, okay, I agree we need to do this for people who can't do it themselves, but I don't want to use government as the apparatus to do it. And I actually spent a fair bit of time in the 90s talking to people and the 2000s. See, after the Clinton debacle, you know, I learned a lot in that Clinton era. Right? I learned how not to organize a campaign to get a health reform bill passed. But I also learned you want to do this right, it's got to be bipartisan. Right? So if it's got to be bipartisan, you've got to take into account these competing worldviews. And so I'll just say, don't forget that's part of what's going on. Second point there, we all talk about excess spending. And we do spend way more than any other country in the history of the planet. Right? And we get outcomes on average not so good compared to so many other countries. And so we do spend a lot of extra money, but it's also true, one person's excess cost is somebody else's income. That makes it kind of hard to move from A to B without pretty much a civil war. And finally, and this is the sad truth, we've waited so long, so long. I mean, you'll see in a moment, Germany did this in the 1880s. And they're not that much smarter than we are. They're a little bit smarter than us, but not that much smarter than us. Right? We waited so long. What has to be done is not incremental anymore. It's got to be big. And once America has to do something big, it's important to remember Winston Churchill, you know. You can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> so... <laughs> We're pretty close to the limit there on where we are. So I would just say the path to reform is either a long and winding road if you like the Beatles or a highway to hell if you prefer harder metal. But it is, 
it is a long way, and you can think of Led Zeppelin if you want, but the point is, let's, let's do some history, because it's important, I think, to remember a little bit of this. Bismarck, 1883. And why did he do it? Because he figured out he needed to keep his people healthy to produce the industrial stuff that he wanted to make Germany stand up and compete with, with uh, France and, and England. The Roosevelts, Teddy started this whole thing. Everybody talks about Franklin, and Franklin was a great American, but Teddy actually said, damn it if the Germans can do it, why can't we? You know, he was an impatient man. Truman, after the war, you may know. You may know Roosevelt, Franklin, thought about it hard and decided not to push health care for two reasons. He kind of had enough on his plate. And second, the American Medical Association, such as it was at the time, vehemently opposed the very idea of a national health care program because while the Roosevelts liked Bismarck, the docs here didn't because it turns out the government didn't pay them near as much as they were making even then. So Truman was the first one to actually introduce legislation and tried to push it and he did it right after the war, of course, when he took over because he thought, okay, here we are. We've got this great sense of solidarity, still surviving our, our valiant fight around the world. And Lord knows we provided health care for the soldiers, and by then the soldiers were half the population, so why not just take it to the country? But of course we weren't quite ready. So Dingle Sr., John Dingle Sr., who's now, his seat has been passed to John Dingle Jr., and Don, John Dingle Jr. is now in his 80s, so it's been a while. But Dingle Sr. took up the mantle after Truman was out of office, introduced it every year. Then don't forget the Great Society and then Nixon, right? Great Society did Medicare and Medicaid, but Nixon did the HMO Act, which required every employer to offer an HMO alongside a, a, another plan if there was an HMO willing to meet the conditions of that employer. And the ERISA uh, basically uh, enabling self-insurance so employers could cut their own deal and go their own way and find more efficient ways to pool risk as opposed to what insurers were giving them. All of that was under Nixon. Then Carter versus Kennedy in the 1980 campaign was all about Kennedy wanted to go all the way and do health reform again. You may know Kennedy has act, was trying um, as a young senator in the uh, Nixon era. And then, of course, Reagan won, and some people would say, well, that was a vote against national reform. Well, yes, it was, but under Reagan, we got both. I bet you probably don't know what TEFR is. It all sounds like alphabet soup. That's what started health plans being able to compete for business in Medicare. And by the way, Reagan's people looked at the way we paid hospitals, which at the time was pretty much just cost plus, just tell us what it costs, we'll give you some more which had the effect of increasing cost. I don't know why. But anyway, <laughs> um, DRGs, Diagnosis Related Groups, were a very good idea. It was the very first bundle price because it basically said, you know what, we're going to figure out what it normally costs the average hospital to take care of the person with this condition. That's what you're going to get. And man, I'm not kidding. Within a year, average length of stay dropped two days. And far as we can tell, nobody died. Right? Because what happened was it was suddenly in the hospital's interest to become efficient as opposed to not. And turns out if you can get Medicare patients out the door quicker, you can sure as heck get people younger than that. So this actually was a very good thing, and it came from Reagan, who knew. And then, of course, George Herbert Walker Bush and Clinton. George Herbert Walker Bush, you may recall, took a lot of, uh, I believe the technical word would be grief, from his own party about having agreed to that budget deal right, because he was actually, I would say, um, a decent human being, and he thought, hey, we've got to balance the budget. This is getting serious. So he cut the deal with Darman, and he raised taxes, so he thereby put the lie to no new taxes, and he never got over that in his own party, right? But the deal he cut with Waxman from California was to expand Medicaid in the single biggest expansion we ever did, except for the beginning of it and the one we're about to do. So that all came from him, and also under him came RBRVS, which is another alphabet soup, but it basically said the same thing for doctors that we did for hospitals. Let's just stop paying them what they want. The way usual, customary, and reasonable went was doctors would submit their prices they would like to charge, 
and the blues originally and then eventually the government would take all the prices submitted and compute essentially the 75th percentile and that's what they would pay. And they use the mumbo jumbo of usable, customary, and reasonable to make it sound normal. Well, the great flaw in the system was once doctors learned what other doctors were charging, because by definition, let's say they charge 40 bucks for an office visit, then the UCR comes out and it's 80. Duh, they're all charging more than me. Boom, everybody starts raising their prices. And so again, this highway to hell or stairway to heaven, whatever you want to think about it, that cost escalation was killing us. What resource-based relative value scale was about was taking a serious look at what does it really cost account for the extra education that the specialists and the surgeons have to go through and build in practice cost and, and malpractice cost and make that a reasonable basis for a fee schedule. By the way, even though it's far from perfect as any price schedule would be, every insurer in the country uses it too. They just have a different conversion factor. So it is in fact a very smart investment. Again, all that happened under George Herbert Walker Bush and then Clinton, after he got his clock cleaned on, on total reform, did manage to get HIPAA and S-CHIP passed, both of which arguably improved the civilization. And finally under W, even W. You know, W is better than everybody thinks, my humble opinion. I actually met him at the end of his presidency. And you know, well, I shouldn't go into too much detail. I'll just say he's a lot smarter than he acts on TV. But anyway, W, um, W, gave the single greatest increase in funding of community health centers, probably in 50 years, and then of course the Medicare drug bill. So the point of this little history is notice the pattern. There's a recurrent trend toward trying to make all Americans have access to care. Keep expanding access. Second, never lose sight of the fact we gotta pay for this. There is no magic ATM in the back room. We gotta pay for this ourselves, and in fact, we also wanna preserve as much as possible our market freedom and our market liberties because it is in the preservation of those liberties that we maintain our American essence. And then I also wanna point out, and that's the whole point of that whole long thing, almost everything we've ever done was bipartisan until the most recent deal. So what the hell happened? Well, you know, the timing was tough. Let's go back to the beginning of 2009. Let's even go back a few months before, right? During the campaign, we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. We lost 3 million jobs from the start of the recession until the middle of 2009. Right? So it was a very difficult time to think about taking on this huge political task of trying to get a national health reform law passed when Clinton had failed, Wilbur Mills and Lyndon Johnson failed. They settled for Medicare and Medicaid in 65. They couldn't do the big thing. FDR didn't even try. Truman just introduced it and gave up pretty quick. Okay, so it was incredibly ambitious. But Obama knew from the lessons of Clinton, you got to go soon. You cannot wait. You've got to use the maximum political capital you've got. And the maximum capital you're going to have is the first day you're elected, because that's the only day everybody still likes you. Because <laughs> you haven't done anything to piss them all off yet. So the timing was tough, but he had no choice. The second thing he had no choice about was to let Congress write it. Trust me, I was on the team of about 40 people who wrote the Clinton Law in a hotel room. And then we delivered it to Congress. Didn't work out too well. They didn't like it all that much, even though, of course, it was a brilliant piece of legislation. <laughs> in fact, a lobbyist once told me, Lynn, it's just absolutely perfect for eggheads, has no hope of getting any vote ever, but it's very clever. Well, anyway. So Obama knew he couldn't just do that with a bunch of eggheads he could control. He basically had to turn it over, God help us, to the committees. Democracy is supposed to work this way. And he knew, given the Clinton experience, that was the only way. So he had to have Congress own it, which means, of course, it doesn't go quite as fast as you would like. But nevertheless, they did meet off and on. And, it, and let's not forget, 
he didn't exactly have a welcoming opposition spirit to greet him. Let's go back to January of 09. Remember, we're losing 800,000 jobs a month. Now, I'm an economist. Every macroeconomist on the planet said we have got to stimulate our economy. We're the biggest economy in the globe. The global economy is teetering on the edge. And let me remind you, in the Great Depression, unemployment reached 25% of our country. We were having a hissy fit over 10, 25%. So every macroeconomist said, you gotta spend money and only the federal government has a credit market credibility to borrow and spend enough to really make it a difference to avert the free fall to hell. So the question was not whether to do a stimulus package, it was how big. And there was a lot of debate about how big, but there was really not a debate about whether, except in the National Republican Caucus, where Mitch McConnell, who's this smart? McConnell held a meeting, both, part, both houses, all the R's, and he said, I'm told I wasn't there, obviously, but I was told on good authority, he said this. Okay, here's the deal. These guys over there, those D's, they have to pass the stimulus bill to save our economy. They have the votes. They will do that. But if we oppose it to a human being, we can blame the deficit that will get bigger because of this on them, and we'll get power back that way because we'll scare people about big deficits. And they have no choice. They got to do it. And then we can make them all look radical. And every time, we ch every time you get a chance, call them radical, crazy, socialist, whatever, Martian, you know, all that stuff. They're not normal people. We're going to paint them as extreme. We'll get power back. McConnell did that knowing full well the D's were going to save the economy by voting for the stimulus package. Every single House Republican voted no on the stimulus package twice. In the Senate, only three Republicans voted yes, the two women from Maine and Specter from Pennsylvania who changed parties in two more months. So my point is not to say the Republicans are evil because I would say the Democrats would have probably done the same thing in the same circumstances. Trust me, there's lots of stories of equally perfidious behavior. But my point is to say, how the heck are you going to make it bipartisan when that's the way they behave around the macro economy, which is teetering on the edge of collapse? They weren't exactly going to make it easy to have a bipartisan bill, even though I can assure you the original Clinton era stuff the Republicans did was very, very close to what Obama did. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. But let me also talk about some sad things that happened along the way. Kennedy's illness. Even after the stimulus stuff, we had two big chances to have a bipartisan deal. And they both fell apart for personal reasons. You may know, you may not. Edward Kennedy and Orrin Hatch. Not exactly what you'd call peas in a pod, but they are, believe it or not, or they were, very close friends. You may know when Kennedy had his last public alcoholic activities down there in Florida with the nephew and the bars, Hatch flew to Florida, famously put his hand on Teddy's knee and said, Ted, you've got to recover. We need your voice back in the Senate. Very close friends. And Hatch, you may know, is a shirt-wearing Mormon. I mean, he's not <laughs> Catholic or anything. Just he believed in Ted's contribution to America. They talked every day, every day, after Kennedy was diagnosed. I know this because I talked to both their aides all the time. And each of them would say to their top aide every day, go back and make a deal, work this out. I know this because they would complain to me. How can I deal with that guy? I don't trust him. I said, let's go to a bar and talk about it. So the problem was Kennedy got sicker way faster than anybody knew. And as he got sicker and weaker, the family felt compelled to stop those kinds of conversations. This was in April of 2009. Hatch was, frankly, hurt that the family cut him off that soon because he didn't really know how sick he was yet. Hurt turned to anger, and no one else in the Senate had the respect of Orrin Hatch that Ted Kennedy had. And so it didn't matter, his aide told me, what 
kind of bill they brought him. Could have been one he'd written. He's not going to take it because he didn't work on it with Ted. The second opportunity we had was Grassley and Baucus, who have not quite as deep but nevertheless a good relationship. And Grassley, you may remember, was instrumental, along with Baucus, in getting the S-CHIP legislation, the coverage of children, uh, passed in the Clinton era, in the 90s. They co-sponsored sections and made it all happen. They, Senate Finance Committee, Baucus chair, Grassley's ranking. Sometimes Grassley would be chair and Baucus would be ranking. Very long and distinguished relationship working together. Even after the stimulus stuff, Grassley called up Baucus and said, look, I'd like to set the table for a bipartisan conversation about health reform. You and I both know we need to do this as a country. What was coming up first on the docket was the reauthorization of S-CHIP, right, because it had been vetoed by W in the waiting days of his administration, so it had to come back up in early 09. You may remember, you may not, there was a Senate version and a House version. The version that went to W that he vetoed was from the Senate, as they often are, and the Senate version had a provision that was very important to Grassley, and that provision was this. No money shall go for legal immigrant children. If you're not American, you can't be an S-CHIP expansion or reauthorization. Now, Grassley says to Baucus, and by the way, that bill, in the W era, that bill had 17 Republican co-sponsors. They had a veto-proof majority in the Senate, not in the House. So Grassley said to Baucus, you bring me that S-CHIP bill and I will bring you at least 10 Republicans, and we can set the tone for a bipartisan S-CHIP reauthorization, get away from the stimulus stuff, and start having decent conversations about full national health reform. And any reasonable person would have taken it, because you can take care of legal immigrant children later, for Christ's sake. Let's get this done and get 10 Republicans on board. Right? Set the tone, all that stuff. Baucus called the White House, White House said no. I know this because Baucus' aide didn't call me. I'm like mental health for these people, you know. They call up and <laughs> complain, and I'm old, so I can listen. And so anyway, I was told, the White House said, see, here's the thing. We've, we've been kind of beating on the liberals, and they need something, and they really want this immigrant kid thing. And I know, I know, I know, but we just got to have it. Baucus said, you realize you're walking away from 10 Republican votes at a time when it could actually set the tone for a much better, I know, I know, I know, I don't, okay, it's got to happen. So it was also some key judgment calls by Obama that kept us in this situation. And then I think it's fair to say, don't ever underestimate the power of fear. And our people were scared. And it was easy, therefore, to drum up fear and capitalize on. If you oppose reform for your own reasons and you know people are scared, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how to fan the flames. And the economy was, after all, in pretty bad shape. And so it was easy to say, we can't afford this. How can you possibly be talking about a new entitlement? Yada, 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 yada. So that's why I love this picture. See, she's smiling. You know, she's standing, in case you don't know, in front of the American Airlines Arena in Dallas where the Mavericks play basketball. And the reason I love the picture, aside from her smile, is that I'm pretty sure, I'm just almost certain, that she did not read 2,000 pages and come out and conclude that indeed this health care law is exactly what they just taught me at SMU was Karl Marx doctrine. <laughs> I'm pretty sure somebody gave her the sign. And the reason I'm pretty sure about that is because if you read the law and you're as old as me, you would know that in fact the structure of this Obamacare was the very same thing that that Chuck Grassley and Orrin Hatch and John Chafee and Bob Dole and 14 other Republicans, 18 in total, supported in 93 as a counter to Clinton. Individual requirement to purchase, reorganize a small group in individual markets, pay for it with Medicare savings and a tax change. Obamacare was a Republican idea before it became socialism. Okay. But it was made socialism for tactical reasons, and here we are. Now, I'll just point out, because I know I'm in the South, a lot of stuff has been called socialism. You know, this is the, actually a quote from today's blogosphere. But look at the AMA in 1965. 
placing an advertisement in 100 newspapers to make its position clear, opposition to the creation of Medicare, the advertisement calls Medicare the beginning of socialized medicine. You may know Ronald Reagan actually got his national introduction, aside from being an actor, by making a recording, made a, re uh, uh, of a vinyl album that was mailed to every home in America, citing the AMA's position why this was socialism. So this is from Poolsville, Maryland in 1954, and I like this because it proves it wasn't just Arkansas that was upset about this stuff, uh, where I grew up. Integration is communism, that's my point. All this stuff has always been called communism. This is Little Rock, and I want, to pay, I want you to pay attention to the anger in that woman's face. This is, of course, one of Little Rock Nine, going to high school or trying to. And look at the anger in this woman's face. That's pretty similar, in my opinion. This, of course, is screaming no Obamacare. And my point is simply, people get angry about stuff, and they're scared because they're scared of change. And our job is to try to remember that. Now, I might be the only person in the United States who went to both the John Stewart rally on, Capitol, on the uh, monument and the Glenn Beck rally. Now, I admit I went to the Glenn Beck rally not entirely of my volition, but because my brothers, who are a little bit older than me and we're not burdened with the education God gave me, so they see life far more clearly. <laughs> and they felt compelled to because they thought it was important for me to say, okay, fine, I'll give it a go. So I went, and I'll tell you what I'm glad I did. First of all, they're very polite, very polite people, not, not your normal Washington crowd. Second, they're mostly scared. And they're scared because our economy was going through, and by the way, most of them are small business people. And by the way, General Motors went bankrupt. And Merrill Lynch essentially disappeared, got bought by somebody else in an hour and a half. Lehman Brothers, poof. Capitalism seemed to be falling, and nobody's bailing them out. Their revenue's dropping 30, 40, 50, 70 percent. At least true in my brother's case. And nobody's bailing them out. And by the way, they don't think anybody's actually telling the truth about what's going on in Washington. Have you ever tried? Have you ever tried to figure out exactly what we spend on health in the United States using the official Office of Management and Budget documents? That's a good assignment for any college senior out there. You figured out, you come tell me. We do not do a good job of communicating to our people what the heck we're doing. So anyway, Republicans weed out your progressives. That shouldn't take too much longer. Abort health care. Abort Obama. Save our country. Key phrase, save our country. They love our country too. They're Americans too. And they're mostly scared. We've got to figure out how. But do watch out for this one. Okay. That would be Darth Vader's sister. And what she is is living proof that if you let anger go on unchecked too long, it will turn to hatred. And hatred will twist your heart. That's why the good book tells you to forgive, not just to be nice to your fellow man, but to put down your burden and heal yourself. Okay, so where are we now? Well, here's the exciting thing. You know, the models of health care reform, the payment models, the things that will change incentives that might drive us to where we need to be, and that is the place where we can actually contain cost growth and take care of all our people, those models are emerging in the private sector. There'll be an exam for this at the cocktail party at 5 o'clock. But the point is, these are all the different payment models that are being pushed by the Innovation Center out of CMS, shared savings, all these ACOs, different ways of organizing payments so that we no longer pay physicians fee-for-service but in fact pay them in much larger bundles so they have far better incentives to economize on care while improving quality and improving health. So accountable care organizations, patient-centered medical homes in various forms and bundled payment and so forth, dual eligibles, all that stuff. But here's the exciting thing. It's actually going on even faster in the private sector, which means, key point, this is not some government plot. It's actually a darn good idea to reorganize the way we pay people to try to essentially channel self-interest into the social interest of what we need. What this is is a chart from America's health insurance plans. That would be the big national insurance lobby. And it shows a little symbol for a patient-centered medical home. They have many homes, but one symbol 
um, accountable care organizations, bundle payment, very same things that are in the law, but going on now in the private sector in every state in the nation except Mississippi. Now, I told you I grew up in Arkansas, right? So I just have to say one more time. All my life, we grew up saying, thank God for Mississippi, <laughs> because we were 49th in just about everything, and they were 50th in everything, so <laughs> we could always hold our head up and be proud when Mississippi was involved. And once again, they have managed to show, show that nothing important is going on there again. But nevertheless, the point of this is to say, nationwide, the private sector got the memo. We are indeed implementing the very incentive changes we need to start channeling self-interest to serve the public interest to change our growth and cost to enable us to be stewards of our health care resources and serve all our people. So that's why I'm excited. Now the insurance reform implementation part is a tad bumpy. I will agree to that, that you know in California they already are posting what you have to pay in an emergency room, whereas in Texas Last I heard, Governor Perry's got a pistol and he's trying to lead a, a patrol to secede from the Union one more time. So, you know, we do have a difference of opinion here about what to do next. Let me back up just a moment. There'll be an exam on this too, but fundamentally this is, um, um, two ideas are going on simultaneously, which is why it's kind of hard. The colors represent the advisory board, which is a consulting firm for hospitals, the advisory board's March 13th, which is, I stopped updating it monthly because they keep changing, but it's close enough. Point is simply, the colors represent, is a state likely to expand Medicaid or not? Red is no, blue is yes. And then the symbols represent what the states are doing on exchanges, on these new marketplaces for the individual market and the small group. So, a shopping cart, means that the state is going to run an exchange, like in Colorado, New Mexico. And a capital means that the federal government's going to invade your state one more time and take over and run your insurance markets for a while. That's going to be a federal exchange. The handshake is a partnership where the states will do some stuff and the feds will do most of it, but the states will do some key things, including plan management, which is darned important. And the point of this is to simply say America's a big old country. In 1965, 1966, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, passed at the same time in that one piece of legislation. Wilbur Mills slipped in Medicaid at night before they voted. And in 1966, then was the first year you could take up Medicaid. And trust me, that first year, basically, whatever you were doing to take care of the poor, the federal government just agreed to pay half. Okay? Then they figured out how to make this. The first year, guess how many states took it up? 26, exactly half. So when you think about it, that's about where we are now. It's not that unusual. It's a big old diverse country. It took four years before we had 49 states. Arizona didn't come in until 1982, and I will remind you, they still don't have daylight savings time. <laughs> and my point is, it's a big old diverse country. And so, we're going to move at different speeds. Now, there's no doubt in my economist's mind that the financial arrangement to expand Medicaid is so advantageous to the states, right? 100% of the newly eligible for the first few years, 90% thereafter, cover prisoners, which cost people a lot of money, take care of mental health, closing the gap, enabling hospitals in particular to reduce the amount they have to shift to the privately insured to pay for the uninsured. We're paying for the uninsured now, it's just backdoor Byzantine crazy ways. All of that, creating jobs, all of that makes such perfect logical sense. It's totally predictable that 26 states today would say no, right, because after all, what we believe in America is you should be allowed to be stupid as long as you want to, and so we, 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 we tolerate that. But it is true, eventually math will trump ideology, just like it did in the 60s, right? Basically in the 60s it was largely about race. Today it's partly about race. But it's mostly, I think, about I don't want the federal government to be telling me what to do, all that stuff. 
So be patient with your brethren. I think you need to keep lobbying, but you know, just keep laying the facts out, keep spreading it around, making it clear. And the, here's the bigger point. It's okay that we're not all going at once. First of all, to be blunt about it saves us a little money. Second, it means that when they come, they'll be more willing than they would be if they were drag kicking and screaming right now. And trust me, willing in healthcare is better than being forced. Okay, now here's probably the single most, um, well, I'd say maybe important data point in the debate in Washington, because this is the cornerstone of the argument we can't afford it. This is a ratio of federal debt held by the public at, to GDP. So it's basically the ratio of what we owe each other and the Chinese divided by what we produce. So it's essentially a claim on what we produce every year by what we owe. And I want to take you back in time, because I'm a good Southern boy and believe in history, and go back to 1940, and we were at 40% of GDP. And then, boom, up to 110. Now, you probably remember, some of you, what the hell was going on here. Not from living through it, but by reading about it. Right? We had a war. And we had to borrow to build those battleships and B-17s to defeat tyranny around the world. And that was a good idea because we faced an existential threat to our way of life. And we got all the way up to 110% of GDP. And I noticed we didn't shut down the third grade or hospitals. We kept doing this. But then what did we do? We paid it off. Now, this decline was not entirely smooth. Why? Because as you reduce it, Every time there's a recession, every time GDP drops, then by construction, debt to GDP blips up. But if you maintain, this key word, if you maintain your bipartisan consensus to pay off your debt, you can do this. You too can do this. You can go from 110% GDP all the way down to 22. Now the difference was they had a consensus, we got to pay off our debt. It's really just like my grandmother said. It ain't rocket science. You borrow when you have to, you pay it off when you can. It's pretty simple. But then we got to the big hiccup in OPEC. Remember OPEC? Remember buying gas on Tuesday and not on Thursday and all that? That was a big hiccup. But then everything was okay, really, until 1981. Then we started this long increase. Now, what happened in 81? Cardinals weren't in the World Series. It was the Yankees and the Dodgers. What happened in 81? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, fine American, whoop the commies, tear down the wall, all that stuff. But he told us we didn't have to pay for government. He told us we could cut taxes and everything would be fine. Turns out. So at the end of the first Bush term, long came Ross Perot, riding over the sunset with his white horse. Now, I personally love Ross Perot, because he's the only public speaker in America other than me who has bigger ears, <laughs> right? And he's from East Texas. I'm from East Arkansas. So in my opinion, Ross Perot has no accent at all. He speaks with perfect elocution. And Ross Perot, you may remember, was so alarmed by this that he personally spent big money on TV time, sat there 30 minutes, held up little PowerPoints with an increasing debt chart, and I admit, we all thought he was a little bit wacky. But you know what? He made a point that the people heard. He created the space in which Clinton and Gingrich eventually balanced the budget. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. You had a Democrat president and a Republican Congress. Trust me, Clinton and Gingrich do not like each other much. They don't agree on almost everything. And if they did find themselves in agreement, one of them would change their mind to get out of it because they wouldn't want to be seen as being in agreement with the other guy. But they did manage to figure out how to balance our budget. And by God, it was coming down. By God, when Clinton left office, we had a $200 billion surplus. Let me say it again. When Clinton left office, Democrat, President, Republican, we had a $200 billion surplus. What the hell happened? What happened was the Bush tax cuts, a couple wars we didn't pay for, Medicare drug bill we didn't pay for. And then, boom, 
this recent economic excitement. Now, I'm an economist. I don't want to scare you and make you run screaming from the room. I won't use the D word. But I will remind you, we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. We were close. In fact, you may recall, I certainly do, vividly stamped on my memory, in October, before the election, little Ben Bernanke, economist runs the Fed, big Hank Paulson, bald-headed New York investment banker was Secretary of Treasury, together went to Congress at night, met with leaders, both parties, both houses, interrupted playoff baseball to show me Nancy Pelosi and Richard Shelby, this cannot be a good idea. And what Bernanke told him was, sports fans, we are this close to whew. Now let me give you a technical definition of whew. In the Great Depression, I already told you, you had 25% unemployment. I can promise you that was an understated number because then people could go back to their families on the farms and at least eat. Today, I don't want to burst your bubble or anything, the farms aren't going to take us back. We have no bottom. We could have gone to hell. And they knew it. Bernanke was the only economist in my generation, spent his whole life studying the Great Depression. Thank God Almighty W put him there at that moment in history because he had unique credibility to look those people in the eye and say, I know you don't like this, but we don't have a choice. You have got to act now. Now, Congress and act now is a little tough, doesn't go together, took a couple weeks. But they did it. And yeah, Paulson didn't exactly implement the TARP perfectly, he took care of his buddies and screwed his enemies, all that's true. But you know what? We didn't go whew. And so, most of this run up, two thirds of it is actually from the recession itself, because when the recession comes, revenue drops. But then the last third is really the stimulus package. And this is the recovery. But here's the problem. This is the recovery as it starts to drop. But here's the problem. We do not, we no longer have what we had here. We no longer have a bipartisan consensus about how to get our fiscal house in order. So we are on a pathway now, onward and upward forever. No one knows what the limit is. But it ain't infinite, I promise you that. So, we have got to figure out how to get our fiscal house in order. And I can honestly tell you, an awful lot of very smart people spend an awful lot of time and we've all reached the same conclusion. The only way to do this is to get health care cost growth under control. Because health care cost growth is the single biggest driver of our fiscal troubles and, by the way, our family financial troubles because health care used to be 7% of median family income, family premium today it's 21. In North Carolina, it's 22. Whew. Which is, of course, why more and more people can't afford it on their own, which is why we got to start now. So it turns out, you know, I grew up in Arkansas, so unlike you, I did not learn all I needed to know about kindergarten. It took me till seventh grade. Remember that poem, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood? There really are two ways to get this fiscal house in order. One would be to say, you know, we just can't afford the Medicare program we got now, so let's cut it by a third. And we sure as heck can't afford Medicaid. It was way too generous in the start, so let's just cut it by half. And that's what Paul Ryan has proposed. Now, you can guess I don't like his priorities. But I respect the man, I'll tell you why, because he wrote it down. He put down explicit terms of how he would do it without raising taxes one penny to get our fiscal house in order. And by the way, he was far more explicit, far earlier than the other side. In fact, the other side deferred from being explicit because they knew they could demagogue this and win an election, which you might say they just did. The alternative pathway, of course, is to do what I would like to do in you know, truth in advertising. It's full employment for economists, realign incentives. Hey, that sounds like you need an economist to help you there. Right? But when you think about it hard, you think about we got 7,000 CPT codes with which we pay doctors. We've got 458 MSDRGs with which we pay hospitals and 5,000 variations on all of that with all the different private health plans. 
to reline incentives quickly with all that complexity, you'd have to have the wisdom of Pericles. I don't know if you've met Pericles, but Pericles actually ruled Greece in the so-called golden age. I don't want to burst your bubble about the people you've sent us there in Washington, but let's just say they're not Pericles. <laughs> what we do have is Rick Gilfillan, who runs the CMMI, the Innovation, Innovation Center, and Barack Obama, both of whom are smart people, fine, well-intentioned, hardworking. They are not Pericles. And the good news is, unlike the Clinton team, frankly, they know they can't do it all from Washington which is why the punchline here is successful health reform is a participation sport. You want to make this work, you have to get involved. If you're a doctor, don't trust the accountants and the economists to work this out. You make sure you understand the economics of this situation. Most docs don't. They leave it to others. They're busy. It's time to get on the, get on the accountant strain. Okay. So, what are the challenges? Well, the status quo is very good to some people. A lot of money out there being made by people selling stuff that we don't need. And a lot of money being made by people doing stuff they think is the right thing to do. It actually isn't necessary. It's a hard thing to change. Second, the micro math is not the macro math. We're pretty clear that we probably could reduce readmissions, that is going back in the hospital for the same thing you went in for, and therefore in total admissions. But that means, you might have figured this out, after a while, you're going to need fewer beds. Which means hospitals are kind of playing a game of musical chairs. Last man standing, all that stuff. It is still true, we're going to need lots of hospitals. It's still true, the best ones will do fine. But the little ones are probably going to have to either affiliate and learn how to shift complex cases into the bigger regional centers which is, by the way, what they ought to be doing anyway, but that's not what they're used to. There's probably going to be some reduction. Same thing for specialists. If we give primary care a far more expansive role, it's probably going to be as much as a third less demand for specialists. We have less time than we'd like. I talked sort of obliquely about the fact that the debt is owed to each other and the Chinese. Chinese single biggest source of cash that finances our excitement here today. Here's the thing. China, at the moment, needs us as much as we need them. We need their money to finance our debt. They need a place to make sure they can park their extra cash. And by the way, they're essentially loaning us money to buy their stuff. They have to create 10 to 15 million jobs every year just to keep social peace with what's coming in from the countryside. Who do you think they think is going to buy their stuff? The French? Not enough of them. They need us as much as we need them. But you might have noticed this. They all come to college here. They've studied us. And they have concluded correctly that we are incapable of coming up with a bipartisan way to solve our fiscal mess, so they are, shall we say, weaning themselves from their need for us, which means they're moving their economy from 30% consumption, 70% export, to 60% consumption, so they won't need us anymore. As they move to where they don't need us anymore, they won't be parking their extra cash over here and our interest rates will go up. Smart people tell me if they were to do a forced march, which you may recall they've done before, they could do this in 10 years. But here's the thing. If you make an economy move from 30% consumption to 60% consumption, you are creating a big middle class. What does a middle class really want? Freedom. And freedom, my friends, makes them nervous there in Beijing. So they're probably not going to go as fast as they could. So probably we got 15 years. But in my opinion, we better act like we've got 10. Because if we are not done, if we are not extricated from our need for them when they don't need us anymore, this will not be pretty. Our interest rates will go from the Napoleonic floor where they are to God knows where, and they'll never come back down. That's why we've got less time than we'd like. 
Second, our next, we've got to focus on total spend, total cost of care. Those are the only things that really matter. Everybody's got to focus on that. And right now, we don't really have good integration of clinical information, which the doctors and hospitals need, and financial information, which is what the plans put together to pay people. We need to merge these far more explicitly than we have so far. We're working on it. There's some examples, but it's, there's a lot of work to do here. And finally, we need to remember, we pay for the uninsured either way. Wouldn't you rather pay for them in a smarter way? It's an option. So when I get really depressed, I do two things. I go read the second inaugural on the Lincoln Memorial left-hand side, which if you're ever there, I highly recommend. Give you inspiration. And also I read history. And here's the thing. My wife gave me this book called Ratification. Ratification turned out to be a labor of love, 10 years, MIT historian Pauline Meyer. And it's about the ratification of the Constitution. She worked on it not knowing by the time she finished, the Tea Party would make ratification a pretty popular topic. She actually got rich off this. So anyway, the point is, it's about how we did it. And you may remember, I had forgotten, why we have a Constitution as opposed to the Articles of Confederation, which is what they agreed to as soon as Cornwallis went home. Right? We got a Constitution because... The Articles of Confederation did not confer on the Continental Congress the power to tax. And the French, who after all had loaned us Lafayette and Rochambeau, also loaned us money. And they kind of wanted their money back. And by the way, they had a navy, and we didn't. <laughs> and navies had cannons, and they could shoot and blow stuff up. They wanted their money back. And so what the Congress then had the power to do was to basically send a letter and request for the states to send their share. And it turned out Georgia kept sending it back saying maybe next year. You know, we've kind of got enough going on here, gosh. So we couldn't pay the French back. So we went to George and the smart people said, George, you got to do this. And George said, I'm old. I already fought a war for you people. And the nephew I'd have to leave in charge back here at Mount Vernon. His planting season is stupid. I'll be bankrupt time I get home. They said, George, if you don't come, we won't get the right sort. Oh, George agreed. said, okay, but then I get to set the rules. Now, people don't know. I didn't know. I don't think they knew. You know, Jefferson was brilliant. Adams was brilliant. Franklin was smart as hell. All these smart people running around. Washington was a good general, but he didn't write or speak eloquently at all. Nobody knew he really had a political bone in his body. He was shrewd as hell. He shows up in Philadelphia, makes his speech. Of course, in the paintings, he's always a foot taller than the rest of them. And he was taller, I guess, a little bit. But anyway, the point is he had authority. And he said this. We're going to talk about this in this room. We have to debate this in a serious way. You have to be willing to change your mind. You can't do that if you're locked into your constituent's position. You've got to be willing to compromise. We've got to make a nation that can stand up among the family of nations and be one of them. Therefore, my rules are no leaks, no contraband copies. Don't play games with the press. You think the press is crazy wild opposed now? <laughs> Go back and read the 18th century. It was, I mean, there were no rules. about. There was no Columbia School of Journalism, trust me. There were no rules. So Washington understood we had to keep it in this room because he knew they'd have to compromise. Four months they met in Philadelphia every single day, except for Sundays, I guess. Four months they met, no leaks, no contraband copies. And when they had finished... All but three of them signed it. Think about that. None of them loved it. All of them wanted to change stuff. All of them thought it was imperfect. First point, our Constitution was written by elites behind closed doors. That's why the book my wife gave me to get my mind off health reform made me think about health reform. <laughs> but here's the kicker. Then it became democracy on steroids. Why? Because the rules were Nine of the 13 states had to ratify it. 
right? So we had to have state by state, first elections of the delegates and then the ratifying convention in every single state. And by the way, this was before Twitter and email. It took six months. So by the time Virginia debated, of course, they went last. A lot of the other states had already done it or started their conventions. And by the way, this is all in the public, so all the arguments are out there. And I encourage you to read the Virginia debates. Maybe the North Carolina ones are equally interesting, but I will tell you, Virginia is really good at arguing about the role of government. And by the way, one of the three who didn't sign was George Mason, who was the namesake for my university. He didn't sign for two reasons. Didn't abolish slavery which he thought was going to be necessary to make the country stand together. And it didn't have a Bill of Rights. He was terrified of having fought a war, won our liberty, and no limits on the number of terms you can serve in this new Congress, or for that matter, be president. So there were serious debates. The margin of victory in the ratification votes in Massachusetts, the most Federalist-oriented place in the country, then just as now, 26. Virginia, 10. New York, 3. These debates were tough, they were intense, they were long, and the vote was close. And as soon as the new Congress convened, Mr. Madison's first act was to write down 12 amendments, having heard what his opponents said. We ratified 10 of those 12 within six months. They became what we call the Bill of Rights. He listened to their opponents, and they modified their approach. But the opponents agreed to debate fairly and stick to the facts. We can learn a lot from history. Why is this man smiling? You know, there are a lot of people who maybe don't know that when the wisdom of his logic was revealed, he got on a plane and flew to Malta. And Malta is the only place in Christendom that's never been conquered. He went there to give a series of lectures on constitutional theory to a bunch of European lawyers. And some people think he went there because he knew even a pissed off Antonin Scalia couldn't make it up those walls. <laughs> but the real reason he's smiling is because if you look at his decision carefully, and I highly recommend you do that sometime. It might take a couple days, but you should do it. It's a fundamentally American document. And what he says essentially is, I'm not going to kill this thing in an arbitrary court. I'm going to take this problem and put it right back where it should be, which is right in the middle of our politics. Because this is a problem that people have to work out among themselves. I don't agree with the law in lots of ways. He talked about why he thought it was stupid and wrong. But I'm not going to kill it. I'm going to put it back where it should be, and that is among the deliberations of the people of the United States. He trusts us to work this out. If he trusts us, so do I. Thank you very much. You want to? Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, I know I went a little long, but I'm glad to stay and answer questions. I would ask that you. Give me your name and tell me your part in the drama, what you do, so I'll be able to couch the answer in a context that might be useful. Could we just turn that off, you think, Vicki? Is that possible? Or cover it up with some business card or unplug the darn thing. There you go. Thank you very much. Any questions? Our short speeches. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, my name is John Gossett, and I'm a Springboro Hmm. Well, I would say those are very good points and a good question. Um, 
I think it's fair to say that um, you kind of have to make a, a broad choice about whether you want to get everyone covered or not. And any kind of voluntary system without a mandate, you're going to end up with people not covered. And the fundamental reason the choice was made to have the mandate was because actually of the strong desire to make the insurance market, believe it or not, work better than it does now. Because if you have a voluntary market so insurers are free to refuse and people are free to refuse to buy, then insurers are not evil people. They have to protect themselves against the risk of only the sick or more disproportionately the sick coming to them because after all, who's going to be most interested but the people who know they have a condition. The thing about the mandate is it says, look, Everyone's got to come. Then, and only then, insurers can be reassured that the risk pool they will be covering when you change the rules on them and you say you can no longer exclude those who happen to have a condition. You no longer can charge more to people who happen to have cancer or whatever. Then by having the mandate, you close the circle and you make it true that the risk pool they will get in toto will indeed be the population. So it becomes then quite possible to have competition in the insurance market based not on risk selection, but on price and value in the kinds of healthcare delivery they can guarantee by having physicians and doctors in the, and hospitals in their network that are high quality. So the reason, the, the reason for the mandate is to make the insurance market reforms possible. Could you have done it without the mandate? A lot of interesting discussion about that. You may know a lot of economists debate this for years and years and years. And I would say it's kind of interesting in the following sense. The penalty for not buying is so low, right? It starts out 95 bucks. It goes up to two, I think maybe in the, in the end game, it's 2% of income, something like that, which for some people is a lot of money, but for most people's not. So you might say, well, what kind of mandate is that? Well, not much. <laughs> I would agree. And in Massachusetts, by the way, they have even less penalty. And they managed to achieve 97% coverage up there with a very weak penalty. So it's plausible you could do this without the mandate. But I think a lot of people actually believe, and certainly, at least in my experience, insurance folks believe, that if you take away the mandate, you'll never get enough balance in the risk pool to enable them to avoid charging very high prices. So that's why it's, it's all kind of a, of a linked, intertwined system. Go ahead, you want to come? Well, I'm not sure where you get to 158, but I will say this. Um, it's hard to do this without new rules for the insurance market. And you can do those in lots of different ways. In fact, what the law anticipated was that the states would be full partners and that they would indeed be the enforcers, which, by the way, they do today in the insurance market. And so there would be more kind of, if you will, collaboration, and you wouldn't have to make all these new things. But the law set up the potentiality, after all, they wrote it during the debate we just described, that if the states choose not to do it, then the feds have to do more stuff. So a lot of the federal activity is actually in response to states choosing to do nothing, which I would predict, if we all live this long and the law goes forward, that the states will increasingly take on more of those roles and there'll be less of a need for the federal intervention. On the delivery system side, though, I do think we needed federal catalytic change because Medicare is the single biggest buyer. Medicare is the one buyer that can get every hospital's attention. And I'm sure you know, you're an orthopedist, they have gotten every hospital's attention because they've already started paying them less for various things and threatening to pay them less for readmission performance, et cetera. In fact, they've started that as well. So that they are big enough to kind of make it clear old type unaccountable fee for service is not going to be where we're going to be. And by the way, don't forget, every single one, every single one of the Medicare payment reforms that are in the Affordable Care Act are also in Paul Ryan's budget. There's absolute bipartisan consensus. We've got to move to a better, more incentivized system to take more advantage of market forces. There's a difference of opinion in the parties among about the role that insurers will play in a post 
world, but I can assure you the payment stuff ain't going away. It's definitely, it's definitely here to stay. And so for that, we need one more agency. I don't think we need 158. But anyway, yes. Well, it is certainly true that a series of hard and some might say Faustian bargains were made, um, but I will offer a couple of observations because you've asked quite a number of very good questions there. Um, first, the pharmaceutical industry in the United States, you may know, we have become so adept at so-called tiered drug benefits in our private insurance plans that something like 70, 75 percent of all scripts now are on generics. Because for most people, things that are off patent are actually as effective, et cetera. So, so there is kind of less um, true pricing power than meets the eye because those generics are eat, trust me, they're, they're worried about that. The second thing is it's unambiguously true we could have taken a stance like most of the European countries do and say we're not going to pay more than X for whatever drug and since we're the biggest market in the world, yada, yada, yada. I would say that is an option. It is tempting. It is, however, important to remember the second point on the slide where I went through our history. We are mindful of protecting as much market liberty as we can. If we had done that, while it may make tactical sense in the pharmaceutical case, it would have scared the living bejesus out of every other provider in the healthcare world. And it might very well have the effect of lowering what we pay for drugs in the short run, but it might really cost us innovation in the long run. So I'm back to advertising now. Do they spend most of their current margin on R&D? No, because it's way cheaper to convince you know, 19-year-olds to buy Viagra and ESPN Final Four than to actually come up with a new drug. There's no question there's a lot of crazy advertising going on. But my friend, I would simply say, welcome to the First Amendment. It turns out to be really hard to build a compelling case against the right to say what you want to say. I mean, you know, it's a complicated thing. I would say that cat was let out of the bag some time ago. It'd be hard to put the genie back in. What I would recommend we consider is redoing our patent life. And by the way, you may know, normal thing, it takes 15 years to get approval. The patent lasts for 20. You only got five years of juice. They use that juice like crazy, but they do it like crazy because they only got five years. So maybe it actually would make sense to lengthen patent life might actually lower prices because they don't have to make it up so fast. So there's a lot of stuff we could do in my view. The single best thing I think as an economist we could do is to make sure there's countervailing buying power. And again, in the private sector, these uh, private, what do they call them, uh, pharmacy benefit managers, which pretty much run the Medicare drug thing. Why did the Medicare drug bill actually come in way less expensive than almost everybody thought it would? Because turns out those private private you know, pharmacy benefit managers are pretty good at bargaining and they're pretty good at saying we're not going to pay you more than this because we got other drugs just as good. So I would say there's all kinds of sort of philosophical reasons why it was hard to do hard controls. But finally, let me just tell you the real politic truth here. In 1993-94, I was in the room and I actually led one side of the debate in front of the president on whether to do an individual mandate versus an employer mandate. And I was from the economic team, so my job was to defend the individual mandate because that was less threatening to employers and more consistent at the time with Republican views of what was an acceptable way to solve the problem. The al alternative arguer, who by the way was a tool Gawande, we were both a lot younger then, was for the employer mandate because that's what, you know, the Clinton team really wanted, the liberals. So, I finished the thing, and with all due respect to my good friend Atul, I won the debate. You know, I'm funny, you're an average guy. And turns out, after me, the political guy got up and said, well, that's really nice, but let me tell you a secret. The President of the United States has no money. 
President of the United States has no money to run a PR campaign. We know a PR campaign is going to be organized against us. They did not yet know it would be Harry and Louise, but we knew it would be bad. The President of the United States has no money. The only people who will give us money to sell our bill, they thought, in 93, were labor unions. What is the one thing labor unions really wanted out of reform in 1993? Employer mandate. Very good, Lynn. Sit down. You're done. So fundamentally, in the, and by the way, Rahm Emanuel was a young pup deputy chief of staff watching this. Enter today, he is Obama's chief of staff. You think he didn't forget that conversation? So he says to the team, this time, we got to have pharma. Got to have them. Got to have the hospitals. Got to have the AMA. Got to have AARP. What does it take to get them? So what did pharma really want? Not having price controls like Europe not reimportation. And what did they give us in exchange? Well, we closed the Medicare donut hole over time with their discounts, off-branded drugs. But also, my friend, this is the most important thing, the thing you will never see written about. They promised not to spend money to attack the law. Bingo. We got the law because of that deal. Time to drink. One more question? Please join me in thanking okay. the